Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Roleplay Chat. I'm Matt, a game master who can't stop talking about roleplaying games. In this week's episode of Roleplay Chat, we're going to be talking about pantheons. So deities, gods, saints, or creatures that are being worshipped by the, the individuals, the sentient beings of your world. Whether you create your own pantheons or are inspired by ancient pantheons of world history, today's episode is going to be for you. You can be a world builder or somebody who uses existing content. I think regardless, the advice being shared today will be applicable to you and your games. We're going to cover things like how to create your own pantheon from scratch or adapting and using existing pantheons, whether that be from existing settings, you know, fantasy settings or existing world pantheons like the ancient Greek pantheon, for instance. We're also going to be talking about how to incorporate those pantheons and the, the deities and creatures within them into your world in a fun and engaging way for your table. Before we get to the episode, though, I wanted to remind folks that if you want more roleplay chat in your life, you can do so by supporting me on Patreon. There is now a Patreon for roleplay chat. It launched as of two weeks ago, and the Patreon is a fun place where you can come get some updates about the show from me direct and also gain access to exclusive extended episodes of roleplay chat. Those episodes will be ad free and you'll be able to listen in on extended conversations between me and the guest of the show. And if your wallet is a little tight these days, and let's be honest, whose wallet isn't, you can always support the show in ways other than monetarily. So you can support the show by rating it on your podcasting platform, giving me a nice five star review, subscribing to the show, or even sharing the show with your friends who play role playing games. If you think they'd be into these kinds of conversations, I'd love for you to spread the wealth of Roleplay Chat with your friends. Alright, so let's dive right into the conversation. I hope you enjoy it. All right, welcome everybody to the discussion part of Roleplay Chat. I am honored to be talking to you today with a very special guest. We've been working months to try and have each other, you know, our schedules just didn't line up. Actually, I should take all the blame here. It's all my fault. I've canceled uh, I've canceled on our previous recording session. But anyway, I'm here joined by a tabletop RPG writer and content creator. He is the mind behind SideQuest a tabletop RPG resource and magazine with 24 issues out so far and more to come. He's also a Twitch streamer, streaming all kinds of awesome world building and prep content for game masters, among other things. And you most certainly already know him from his YouTube channel, Icarus Games, a place where game masters go to learn about game mastering and share, share strategies to become better at it. Welcome, Anto, to Roleplay Chat. How are you? Thank you for having me. That was an amazing intro. You listing things off, and I'm like, oh, am I doing all those things? I yes. am doing all those things. Oh my god! I don't know how you do it. That's a lot of stuff to keep track. I don't know of. how I do it, but <laughs> thank you for having me. It's great to be here. My pleasure. My pleasure. Anto, uh, before we get going into the meat and potatoes of today's conversation, why don't you let the listeners of Roleplay Chat know a little bit more about you? And specifically, you know, your your style as a game master and player and the kinds of RPGs you like so that we can use that as a framework to understand the uh, advice you're going to be sharing with us today. Of course. So my style has always been like story first. My introduction into TTRPGs in the like 20 years ago that it was, um, it's always been the, the story elements that I've been much more interested in. And when it comes to my style of running the game i am um, do a lot of prep up front and then let that prep sustain me throughout the entire campaign and just wing most of everything else and try and focus as much as i can on players and their story and that's my general approach awesome awesome do you have any uh tabletop rpg systems that you've been playing recently or maybe things that you you're working on that you're like this is super cool i this is my obsession of the moment 
So at the moment, we're playing a Pathfinder second edition campaign, which we started a couple months ago now, and that's become my main kind of driver system. While I was on holiday last month, I picked up Vampire the Masquerade, and I'm very excited to give that a go. I started reading that while I was sat in Florida, and oh, I'm so excited for it. Awesome. Yeah, that's a cool, it's a cool system. It's it. I've never run it either. I have the book behind me and some of the lore stuff too, and it's just so rich in content. Mm, It's a fantastic system. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Anto, I'm really happy that you say that because, you know, I'm kind of like this too in my game mastering style. And it took me a while to realize that actually, right? You know, you prepare for that one shot and you're like, oh, wait, Mm. this is like seven weeks, seven games (laughs) worth of content. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, it's it's definitely a game master style that I think. It goes unnoticed. I think it's not out mm. there as like the kinds of game masters. You know, there's all these lists on YouTube and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. The types of game masters. I feel like this is one of those like subgroups that gets ignored. So it's nice to meet a fellow prepper. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a specific kind of prep though. It's like I'll prep one week and then I won't prep for like six weeks because I've over prepped. And then it's just by the time we get back around to the prep phase, I'm like. So much has happened that I did not expect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So now let's get into our topic at hand, and that is talking about deities and creating pantheons mm-hmm. in role-playing games. And I think that this is something that I, I would be hard-pressed to find somebody who has never at least contemplated doing this, yeah. uh, especially people who are world builders. So, Anto, why don't we go over to you and... Just very briefly, why don't you just tell us, when you think of what a pantheon is, what what's your definition of that? Mm-hmm. So my definition of pantheon, it would be the pretty basic, oh, it's a collection of worshipped beings. I don't say gods necessarily, and I'm sure we'll get into that, but <laughs> a collection of worshipped beings. Okay, awesome. And and do you do you think about, or does the alignment of those beings matter to you when you're creating a pantheon or it's like doesn't matter evil good and everywhere in between that's going to be the pantheon it depends on the system if the system has a lot of alignment support then i'll think about alignment but if the system doesn't care about alignment then i'm much more interested in the more nuanced areas of the pantheon and that doesn't necessarily align with alignment Mm -hmm. yeah 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 absolutely cool so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that definition just a little bit, but I think you did mm-hmm. a good job. Succinct definitions are always uh, more valuable than long-winded ones. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, so I, I like this idea of a group that you're saying. It's a group of people, deities, entities that... Uh, I, I, I like the idea. Did you, did you say worshipped? Ha- there has yeah, to be an element of worship. Right? That are, a group of creatures that are worshipped. Yeah, so I think there's definitely going to be an element of worship. I... I'm going to challenge that for me personally and say that sometimes these pantheon creatures or deities Mm -hmm. might not be worshipped at all or they were worshipped at some point. Mm -hmm. Now they're not anymore. I think you can maybe play around with that. But uh, that that's definitely one. And for me, too, this idea of having bad ones and good ones for 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 lack of of another descriptor, Mm -hmm. bad ones and good ones, I think are important to have kind of a mix uh, a variety of how these uh, deities can be interpreted as far as like their cause. But yeah, maybe I'm bleeding into how we should create them. So let's segue into that right off the bat. So for the people mm-hmm. listening, we're going to try to structure this chat into three main categories. First and foremost, the creation of such a pantheon and how Anto and I do it. Then we're going to talk a little bit about maybe using or adapting existing pantheons for your games? Because I know that that's something that a lot of folks do, myself included, uh, Mm -hmm. depending on kind of the flavor of the game you're running. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about incorporating all of these beautiful deities that you're creating into your world in an exciting way for your players to be able to, you know, sit back and enjoy them for what they are. Yeah. Yeah. So Anto, over to you first. When you're creating a pantheon, Maybe you're creating a Pantheon for your game. Mm -hmm. What does that process kind of start? How does that start? What does that look like for you? Usually, I don't, I won't typically sit down and make the Pantheon as like a conscious effort of like today, I'm going to work on the Pantheon specifically, but I will 
think about pantheons, the gods, deities, creatures of worship throughout the world building process when I'm doing other stuff. So if I'm building up an area of the world and I've got a city and I'm like, oh, it'd be nice to have this city be really pious in some way. What could, what or who could they worship? Mm-hmm. Let's have a think about it. And then I'll use the context of the the things I know about the city to decide on some archetypes for a deity for that city. So if it's, you know, if it's a coastal city, maybe they worship a god of the sea and storms. I'm like, right, okay, what does that look like in reference to the people that are worshiping the deity? And I always try and start from the point of view of the worshippers and how they interact with the pantheon first before thinking about kind of the empirical what is this deity like in reality i like to think of the perception from the point of view of the worshippers first it's neat that's neat so it's kind of going like you're reverse engineering Mm -hmm. the the deity in some in some sense does does that mean then that in a homebrew world that you might create there you'd have no perception of what the deities would be kind of on on the surface and then it just bubbles up as it's relevant is that what you're kind of saying so uh, by the time i get to the point where my players are interacting with it i usually have a more concrete defined group of deities to present them and when i give them kind of their campaign document and hey, it's the the world i'll usually include a really brief description or a really brief summary of all the gods that they're likely to uh, interact with worshippers of, or mm. their characters will have heard of in that document. But I don't expect them to interact with all of them right away, and a lot of it is really, really surface-level stuff. Like, this is the god of the sun. This is the god of war. Here's a sentence about them. And then That's it. Yeah. they just interact with it from the point of view of either their characters or NPCs who are worshippers and show them how someone would worship this character. Neat. That's cool. That that makes a lot of sense. That That's kind of how I have my players interact with the deities that I create as well. Um, but I do kind of... My world-building process seems to be a little bit different from yours mm-hmm. in that the Pantheon is one of the first things that I'm going to think yep. about. Uh, oftentimes, to the Pantheon will be very critical to how I create the factions of my world because mm-hmm. there'll be there's usually some element of like religious affiliation with some of these factions yeah um and even if the factions aren't religiously affiliated I feel like the pantheon's influence the god's influence will kind of bleed into the behavior of those people um yeah. so if, yeah for me it's it's usually a map or something mm-hmm a list of like six main deities that are going to be the the cornerstones of this region and then i align factions with them that way yeah. but uh okay that's cool that's cool uh let's go with numbers what's what's okay. a pantheon how how many do you need to have a pantheon for you personally i don't know what my minimum number is uh, i know my current my current pantheon has about 21 gods in it um, and okay. then a bunch of demigods and some other affiliated creatures. Um, but the way I approach deities in the, the within the lens of my role playing games, and certainly the homebrew campaign that I've been running for the last like six years, is that the the gods that exist now aren't divine benevolent beings. They're just they're essentially player characters that have gotten powerful enough that no one can question that they are gods. And that okay. other people worship them. They have the ability to give power to people, and they have the ability to like smite anyone that would question them. And looking at pantheons in that lens has completely changed how I interact with like pantheons and deities uh, in world building and as a game master versus a player. That's super super interesting, actually. Yeah, because this idea of having them be accessible uh is is interesting is is that something that goes on in your games like these are living creatures that the players can walk up to at any moment if they really so wanted to in our first campaign they met four or five of them and one of the characters became a god by the end of it because you know that's the ultimate player goal yeah um (laughs) And like the idea of fighting gods is not alien to my players. Um, so the the kind of the reality that these incredibly powerful creatures exist 
is just taken for granted by my players. They're like, of course they exist. It's not a question of blind faith. It's they they're out there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. We just gotta go find them, stop them, or or become allies with them or whatever. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. I like that. I like that. How does the uh, interplay between these creatures affect your creation process? You know, if you've already got, let's say, a god of the ocean, mm-hmm. uh, and now you're making a god of fire and war or something like that, do you, I guess, two parter, do you think about how these two creatures might interact with one another? Mm-hmm. And if you do, how does that influence your creation of, of these deities? Um, so now that I'm this far into the process, because I've been building this this same homebrew world now for many years, um, mm-hmm. so there is de- I definitely think about how the gods interact with each other, and then how that trickles down into the world. And a lot more of my world building now is impacted by the gods than it was like six years ago. Now I know a lot more about my world and how the gods have influenced it and shaped it, which helps when I'm building things to go, I have an event here in the the history of this region Mm -hmm. where X thing has happened. What can I tie this into? And a lot of the times it's the gods because something will have happened that fits within the realm of one of the gods. And you can go, okay, giant explosion here. Well, I know this god really likes giant explosions, so slide that god into the slot for the cause and then figure out why after the fact yeah i like that i like that um do you have any advice for people listening who because i know that's something that i personally struggle with i like having it all figured out ahead of time um, especially in the context of these ultra powerful deities or beings you know winging something about them at the table can have serious consequences i think Mm -hmm. on on the world uh, and the setting that you're playing in so what kind of advice could you give to people who are uh, following this method of creating the deities kind of as they go Mm -hmm. and as they become relevant Um, so the biggest thing i would say if you're not if the players aren't interacting directly with the god if they're interacting with anyone but the god themselves then you can treat that person as an unreliable narrator so Mm -hmm. the person might worship the god they might be high up in the hierocracy for that particular faith but it doesn't mean that everything that they say is empirically true they might be like oh this god is responsible for this event they might believe that a lot of people might believe that but it doesn't mean it has to be true and when it comes to putting things down in an improv style when you're at the table and then realizing you've made a mistake and need to roll that back a little bit someone else can come along and be like well that's just not how it happened and now you've mm-hmm. got two people with two views and the players have to kind of figure out or decide which one is actual fact. And you can steer it towards the one you you would rather retcon into. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Make the retcon canon. in. Mm. Yeah, that's really neat. <laughs> I, I really like that. It reminds me actually of one time I had my players uh, meet a bard mm-hmm. who was singing a creation myth. Because some one of my players like, I want to know how this world was created. And yeah. I'm like, okay, I have no idea. Let's make a creation myth. But by the end of the game, that creation myth was like total fabrication. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I didn't do the thing where I had a rival come and, and, and call him out on it. So I might do that sooner or, or later. But I effectively made it understood that this person, this bard, was just putting out propaganda yeah. for for another group you know, and trying to get people to buy into this story. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of fun ways that you can mess with that. I I do it all the time. I'm only just realizing I've never reflected on the process of it, but I do it all the time. (laughs) As soon as a few weeks ago, my players were in a situation, they know empirically that the world they're on is a a sphere. They, it's a planet. They've been to space as players still had characters interact with them that like the earth is flat just as a fact we know it we know that it's flat and then one of the players picked up on that and there was like my character would believe that obviously and had the players arguing because they had character knowledge that was different to their player knowledge it was great i love throwing things like that in yeah 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 that's really cool and it's fun to sit back and watch the players do that right to have like a 30 minute scene where they're just interacting and I don't want to say bickering, but it's a nice role-playing yeah. scene of them contradicting one another. It's fun. That's that's cool. 
is uh, before we move on to the next uh, the next pillar i did want to ask you if you had any strategies for kind of cataloging or maintaining these the, the, these deities i you know note keeping strategies or tools that you use because i know that that's something that i have a hard time with i'm mm-hmm. sure others do too I do. I have a template that I use for all of my deities that kind of gives a brief overview of them, um, a description of kind of how they appear in the world, what they're all about, any description of kind of their typical appearance, because I like the idea that a lot of deities have the ability to change their form and appear to different people in different forms. And then I will keep notes of kind of what are their motivations, or more importantly, what's the motivation of like their principal worshippers. Because most of these deities will have something equivalent to a church Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. that worships them. And what's the goal of that church? Because I think that can be different to what the deity might be. And you get some interesting drama there. And then the other thing I really like to do is make notes of like heralds and saints for the deities and get some kind of hierarchy in terms of the divine beings related to gods, because they are much more easy to introduce to the players than the gods themselves so instead of going hey here is the god of the sun you can introduce a few saints related to the god of the sun and there if the players go off the reservation and attack these saints they're not just killing god that's fair enough they they can have a disagreement with the saint it's not so bad um actually you bring up you bring up something really interesting anto and maybe we should talk about it briefly before we move on and it's kind of the organizational structure mm-hmm. of the deities that were that that you're creating and the pantheons that you're creating do you have any any uh anything to say about that and how you how you go about doing that again i feel like it's going to be a common theme when it comes to my approach to kind of pantheons religions deities i like to have multiple groups worship the same being but from a different point of view because i think it adds a lot of texture to your world and makes all of the gods much more multi-dimensional so what i normally advise to people when they're getting started and like oh i want to make a pantheon i'm like start with a smaller number of gods and have them occupy multiple domains and then have religions for each of those domains so you can have one god that is the god of the sun and the god of war and you have two completely separate churches that worship these various aspects and then you can see where they overlap where do they come Mm -hmm. into conflict and get a lot of interest in texture based on one god yeah that's fantastic advice um i i do something similar the domains is a is a nice way to do it i think Mm -hmm. Uh, i also try to do it with function yeah so i have i have a god in my in my game that is the god of like order and justice Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff but you know the the functional elements of this entity in the world is that the judges and the people putting out the the order of mm-hmm. society have their own their own motivations and own yeah. their their own things that they're trying to do and manipulate the world and the fabric of the world in their own way so yeah sure they're all praying to the same person as the one who's who's praying to the god of 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 justice because they want their family to be safe or order yep. or whatever but yeah no i love that so having it have different functional elements in the world can be neat too because you can mm-hmm. have different agents interact but now i'm bleeding into some other parts of what i want to talk to you about so <laughs> let's 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 move on before i before i do that too much more uh one thing that came up quite frequently in my game mastering and when i talk to other game masters is when i make reference to the gods of their world mm-hmm. they often talk about being inspired by ancient Norse gods or ancient yeah. Greek gods or things or ancient Roman gods or what have you. Mm-hmm. And then they take those deities and then adapt them. Pick Maybe they cherry pick some of the ones that are more relevant for their setting, mm-hmm. or maybe they have a pantheon and then they encounter a scenario where they don't have a God covering that particular thing. So they go and yeah. they, they pluck it out. Um, do you have any experience doing that in your games? I guess first. Oh yeah. My question. yeah. Like the, the drawing from inspiration, real world inspiration, previous stories they've written. It's inevitable when you're creating anything, and I think that leaning into it, and the depending on the way you lean into it, can be really useful. Like one way that I have used in the past is you take 
the uh, an existing pantheon, we'll say the Greco-Roman gods, and you go right, okay, these I'm going to use these gods in my world, but they were the gods that were before. So anytime I have a hole in my new pantheon. I can draw on those old gods and draw directly from the old pantheon and can leverage some of the real-world knowledge the players have to inform them about some themes or character by using these gods, like pull a god that the players are going to know, and that will give them meta information that they can use as players. Yeah, that's actually super important. I find that if the gods are too inaccessible as far mm-hmm. as like understanding them and drawing parallels to them you can get players to check out pretty fast yeah i tried to do something like this where i had these gods that i created out of nowhere and and they were like elemental gods of some kind so it, it was kind of hard to draw direct parallels to mm-hmm. pantheons that we are familiar with yeah. at my table and i just didn't get anybody really at the table to bite on any of like the the cool myths that I was trying to like seed into the world, yeah. and it was a bit of a disaster. I had to scrap a lot. Of, I mean, reskin a lot of that. Material. Yeah, yeah. I think the player buy-in when it comes to like the pantheon and religions is difficult. It's one of the things that I found consistently hardest to get players to actively buy into mm-hmm. is pantheon stuff. They'll happily pick up some of the information about the gods through osmosis and then years later be referencing things without really realizing it but getting them to actively go yeah i want to play a cleric because i want to explore the relationship between my character and this particular god super hard to do absolutely especially like it's so bizarre to me because that's what a cleric is and like the same thing goes with like a paladin or any of these other religious like affiliated character classes in theory, 80% of their like lived experience as a yeah. as a character ought to be with their, you know, going to the, the church or the ceremonies mm-hmm. or whatever and like praying and fulfilling the 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 the, 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 the like credo of that particular yeah. deity. But like now, nah, I just want to smite stuff. Like, let's go. That's the thing. <laughs> I think that's where the disconnect between like the the GM brain and the player brain comes in. The player looks at a cleric and goes, "Look at all the cool spells I can do." And the GM looks at a cleric and goes, "Look how much role play potential there is in the interaction between me and my god." Like, I wonder whether if you polled like cleric and paladin and warlock players, whether they would proportionally be a higher number of GMs. Because they're like, ooh, there's roleplay juice here versus yeah, yeah, ooh, yeah. cool spell goes bang. <laughs> that that would be a fun that would be a fun poll to do. I I imagine the cool spell goes bang would win that uh, yeah. by a landslide. <laughs> um, like not not even no no questions asked. But um, all right, cool, cool. That that I that kind of segues into trying to get it into the adventures quite well. Mm-hmm. So maybe I'll I'll pitch it to you. One last time, Anto, before we move on to that. But do you have any other advice or or stories or insights that pertain to incorporating existing deities into a pantheon that you've created before we move on? My my biggest advice is if you are struggling with pantheons, take an existing pantheon, reskin it a little, and then at the start, it's going to be really blatant that you have taken the Norse pantheon and mm. you just have all the Norse gods. But the further you get into your world building, when you use the context of other things that you've done to bring it back into that that reskinned Norse pantheon, the pantheon will start to change because your world is not our world and things won't align perfectly. And over time, it will become Norse-inspired gods that are their own thing versus just Norse gods. Yeah, that's a really good point. Another thing too, now that you, as you were saying that, I, I thought of this, and maybe it's kind of a silly example, but I had a god that was like a fire god in mm-hmm. one of my games, and the god took the form of a giant tiger, and I used the description, of, you know, in Aladdin, that like sand mm-hmm. tiger that like opens mm-hmm. his mouth, the cave of wonders. Yeah, I used that as the description of my god, and. I could not, from that point on, stop having my players reference Aladdin <laughs> in my game. And it was fun. Like, it was all in good jest. But yeah. <laughs> but that took away, I felt, a lot of the, like, oomph that I was hoping yeah. that that god would have. 
And it totally stole the identity of that god. Like mm -hmm. now the god was a giant sand tiger and they would make jokes like nonstop. And like, I'm not saying that that's bad, but if you care a lot about having these deities that you're creating that stand on their own mm -hmm. and are their kind of their own character, if you will, yeah. in your world, making references to existing content that you know your players are just going to lose their mind off of, don't, yeah. don't do that. <laughs> you you want to go more obscure with your references and certainly more obscure with your names. Because if you name it after a character or something that players are familiar with, and especially something that is a joke to them, you've you've lost the battle immediately. Uh-huh, it's game over. There's no there's no going back. You might as well lean into it and have like a Jafar. I should have done yeah. something like that, like had like a Jafar character or something. In, anyway. In terms of like incorporating existing pantheons, existing worship frameworks, something that I really like doing is taking conceptual worship. So a lot of non-Western religions will worship the idea of something so it'll be the god of the sea or the the harvest or the rains rather than an individual that was a person that had like personified relationships mm -hmm. and i really like doing that for a lot of pantheon stuff especially naturalistic stuff so storms and harvests and things like that but it can also work really well like you were saying with a, a fire god a volcano is an amazing fire god, and it makes sense when you encounter people that worship a volcano as the fire god. Like, of course they do. This thing is giant and spews lava everywhere. Why wouldn't you worship it as a god? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So doing that kind of stuff can be a really grounded way to introduce like deities and worship into the into your world without having to figure out a, a Greek level relationship map of your pantheon, mm -hmm. which is just a nightmare. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that, actually. We probably should have said that from the get-go. You don't need to have a, like, family tree going on. No. You know, it's definitely not something that I've ever done. I don't, I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried, but it's yeah, just Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, the way I will build and the way I advise people to will build are quite often really different, because I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I've, I've got a pantheon of, like, 21 gods with complicated relationships, and there's all this other kind of stuff. But I am insane, so don't do that. Do this much more simple starting thing instead. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, and you're saying, right, it took you six years to get to that point. I think yeah, yeah. having a nucleus of five, maybe, mm -hmm. or six gods, and then going from there, and then, like you're saying, steal somebody. Oh, I like Thor and the hammer. That's yeah. cool. Let's have a lightning god. We're going to call him something completely unrelated to Thor, because otherwise they're going to be quoting Marvel movies at you yeah, all yeah. game. But <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad place to start, and then you let the game kind of yeah take and on a life of its own. If if the players don't care about it, you don't need to care about it. So if none of the players are like, oh, I want to play a pious character, well, then it's only ever going to be background, and you only need to worry about it in a background sense. If someone's like, oh, I want to play a cleric, then you just need to figure out a god for them to worship, and just a couple peripheral relationship gods to them just to get the context of how they interact and yeah you can build up from there you don't need to sit down and go right five thousand years of history i'm gonna figure this all out today <laughs> could you imagine um but you know what though anto the problem with that for me personally is i love doing that stuff oh yeah, I yeah wish me my too. players i wish my players would bite on that so let's let's maybe mutually vent about how we've tried <laughs> to bleed that into our games uh, because I've tried so many ways to get them to to do it and sometimes they've been successful and other times mm -hmm. it's been to my chagrin that they just ignore the cool scroll that is like on the yeah. wall of the ruin or whatever um but yeah so I'll I'll pass it over to you how, now that you've created a pantheon or you mm -hmm. have these gods that are pretty well established in your world what do you do to feed that information and seed that content in the world in a way that makes your players excited to engage with it i take a very shotgun approach to it in okay. as much as i know the players are gonna ignore a good chunk of the things that i try and give them so i need to make sure i'm giving them a good volume of things and then be ready to kind of jump on whatever they latch onto so for example my latest campaign, we're only a couple months in. The very first session, the, the players were going to find like a religious artifact. Did they care about it? 
not even a little bit. I was expecting <laughs> way more buy-in because they I'd like surveyed them beforehand to ask, you know, what are you interested in? What kind of things get you excited? So I I thought I'd gone through, I've ticked all these boxes. Excellent. It's gonna they're gonna be really interested. They they couldn't care less about the thing, the the MacGuffin that they'd gone and found and its religious significance. And now it's just a fancy doily that they use as like yeah. a flag. <laughs> oh, no. So a, any and all background that I had for that just immediately by the wayside because they didn't engage with it. I can repurpose it and move it somewhere else, but I'm not in a rush to. You know, yeah. it's um they didn't tell you they wanted it, so yeah, you're yeah. not gonna but my general approach is I'll give them a small introduction to a thing and I might have a lot more information on this thing. But if they don't immediately bite, I'm like, right, okay, I'm not going to force this on you and I'm not going to immediately move all of that content somewhere else for you to engage with. If it makes sense to, I will. You know, if I find another deity that could take some of these qualities and mean I have to do a bit less work, great. But otherwise, it's just a case of constantly giving them little bits to latch on to, wait and see what they bite on, and then being there ready to be like, okay, you've shown mild interest in this. Let's reward you with information. That's good. That's good. I like that. I like that. I I have man, I have the same experience with, with religious elements in my games. People just don't seem to be all too interested. Mm-hmm. At, or at the very least, not all too interested in the quote unquote good gods. Yeah. They have a lot of interest in like oh, yeah, the yeah, demon yeah. kings and princes and whatever. Like so so I've found some success. I've been experimenting with this a little bit where I present to them like some evil cult or actually most recently I presented to them an evil, uh, it's like a demon, like a, 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 a lesser demon that they had to banish. They, they banished the demon into yeah. this little magic box. Now they're walking around with this box with a lesser demon inside it. And obviously they want to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. So the way to get rid of it is to find the God who opposes this demon, like mm-hmm. in the pantheon and go to the church and talk to the priestesses that are there and, and build a relationship. So I maybe I'm like force feeding it to them a little yeah. too hard, but they definitely go crazy when I show them something evil and yeah. they, you know they put on their let's do good boots and they want to deal with it. <laughs> and usually the the answer to dealing with it is, you know, going and learning about an ancient artifact that mm-hmm. banished this thing in the past. Oh, and who has that artifact? It's in the archives of some old uh, some yeah. old church somewhere or you know that kind of stuff <laughs> i mean at least your players are following that kind of semi like pantheon related task i had a very similar thing at the end of my last campaign the big bad was a demon did the players go to like the church and try- no they essentially built a lead box and then buried him on the moon <laughs> like, they're like we're gonna build a box he can't get out of strip him a little bit of his power, put him in the box, and then we're going to ta- literally take him and bury him on the moon and then wipe all our memories so no one ever knows he was there. But there that's an go. amazing idea, but I really thought we were going to go a bit more down the religious route for this. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, They're really trying everything they can, hey, to avoid it, it seems like. <laughs> that's and real I clever, wonder, though. I wonder whether it's a... Because all of my players have no kind of religious tendencies none of them are devout people and i wonder whether that plays into it and they just it's not something that they personally vibe with so that it's not something they immediately are attracted to in the game or they are like none of them are particularly history buffs or anything like that so a lot of the the juice that i find from religions and pantheons and the way they interact with the world in the world building sense they just don't have Mm, i see i see what you mean yeah that makes sense that makes sense i now that you say that it is interesting because the table i'm playing with all but one of us went to like catholic institutions as kids Mm -hmm. growing up like catholic schools and and i mean i'm i would not consider myself to be religious anymore but back then it was part of kind of the fabric of Mm -hmm. of the school system that i was brought up in and stuff like this and now all those stories to me personally, and maybe now I'm inviting some interesting comments from the listeners mm. of Roleplay Chat, but let's be nice here, folks. To me, those stories were interesting as stories. Yeah. And for that purpose, I use them as inspiration in my games. Mm-hmm. And I think the people at my table maybe have some of those tendencies. So as long as as long as these religious aspects of the game stick to interesting stories interesting conflicts that they can be involved in 
I've had lukewarm success. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, when it starts to be about like, oh, let's figure out which God is like married to that God or let's read a, yeah. let's go do some research on the creation myth. That doesn't really, ha it doesn't really happen. Yeah, I think uh, that as well, there's, there's a level of, a decent level of like religious trauma when it comes to the Western world. And we as Dungeon Masters, you know, we draw on what we know. And if you live in the Western world, you're going to pull on elements that bring in elements that the players have either direct or secondary experience with in real life. And they might not be interested in touching on that in their escapism make-believe. So that might be why a lot of the time you find that they vibe with the really fantasy elements a lot more mm -hmm. when you have weird god, you know, a god that is a giant serpent that lives inside the moon or whatever it is things that are much more out there than you might first think about i think players tend to gel with that a little more because they're like this is obviously way more fantasy than i can give a direct reference point in real life i'm on board with this yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um anto you also mentioned something at the beginning that i thought was really neat and i'd like to dig in a little bit more because i feel like it fits mm -hmm. well here in our in this part of the conversation too it, you when you said you how you create these deities you often mm -hmm. think about how the layman like the regular individual yep. might worship or be uh, in, impacted by mm -hmm. these deities i think that's a really cool impact and lived experience that the players mm -hmm. can kind of interact with as well would you mind sharing some examples of like what a, a faction or a, a particular worshiper might have been an interaction that you had that you could have used to showcase mm -hmm. yeah, uh, of course. the beliefs of that person? Yeah. Um, so I have a, a bunch of different deities that are fairly active in my world. I have one that is the, the called Koros, the mistress of decay. She's the goddess of like, natural death versus murder um and is like the the god for necromancers so the typical worship for this deity is going to be a lot of necromancers a lot of raising of the dead and if you were to go into a temple to koros you might find reanimated skeletons reanimated zombies typically creatures that the players would associate as being evil You'd mm -hmm. find them just mulling around, performing tasks in the church. They might offer services to reanimate your loved ones, and you can just take zombie grandma home with you. Cool. Because in that particular worship group, it is not a taboo thing to reanimate the dead. They are just, it's just bringing them back. And watching the players interact with that when, you know, it's built on. 50 years of skeleton is evil, skeleton needs to be destroyed, and as well as all the other people in the world that aren't part of that faith that go, necromancy is evil. That gives a lot of juicy context. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I have done in my world is that to make it much more complicated, because why wouldn't I, is that <laughs> necromancy in my world, when you animate something typically like a skeleton or a zombie, you're not putting the same creature's soul back in that left the body. You're just pulling a soul out of the ether and stepping it into the body, which is why necromancy is so like blasphemous in mm -hmm. my world, because they're like, you're just taking somebody else's soul out of the afterlife and shoving it in a body. So when you take that extra context into it, it adds a whole nother layer of like, how do the players feel about this? How do the players feel about the whole idea of necromancy and this like open worship of this kind of stuff that's cool i really like that and i think bringing it back to the players is a really smart call right giving them an opportunity mm -hmm. to inter like have introspection on something is always a good thing and especially in this context you know if we want them to be engaging in this super cool deity that you you've put a lot of thought into that's a great way for them to get kind of that buy-in uh, yeah i i've done something different uh, my personal approach is usually to associate it to things that my players kind of are objectives that they're pushing towards. Mm -hmm. So my players are often very like equipment driven. Yep. They want to get the cool new sword. They want to get the scroll that does this or that or the other thing. And I've found a lot of success in layering in just a little bit of religious context. Yeah. Why is this? 
why is this particular sword magic or why is mm-hmm. the, you know maybe there was a story about that and when they're doing their checks to determine the uh, utility of a particular item i'm going to throw that in and yeah. usually that's the that's how i can kind of ingrain little bits of information little bits of knowledge that slowly builds up i i do like the living it as a layman like that that's really really yeah. cool though it's it's it only works if your players are interested in like everyday experiences and experience the world through that every day if all they're interested in is fighting monsters kicking doors taking loot then absolutely putting it in loot putting it in monsters putting the the religious law in monsters mm-hmm. and being and layering that in making it part of taking the monster down or finding out more information absolutely the way to do it but if your players are the kind of players that just like to inhabit a world and learn a little bit more about it it's you know having them experience someone else experiencing an element of your world then it's not like you're given you're not speaking at them they're just watching as it unfolds and they can choose to engage with it or not yeah yeah absolutely another thing too i so one thing that i've been doing a lot recently not recently i i've been asking my table a lot of things to like Mm -hmm. Hey, tell me about this. Tell me about this character. Tell me about this yada yada yada. Um, and one thing that I thought was really fun was one of my players is like a beast hunter. He, mm-hmm. He's he's got a hit list of things that he wants to go and kill, and and you know, yep. almost like a bucket list, but for the cool big monsters that he can that he can kill. And I talked to him on the side, and I was like, "Hey, man! Like, it would make sense for these creatures because they're so powerful to, for them to be affiliated to mm-hmm. the deities of this world. They don't have to be deities in their own right. Maybe that was like the steed of mm-hmm. this guy or that girl or whatever. And maybe this other creature was some offspring that like nobody took care of and became this evil demonic thing. So I asked him to come up with." I asked him to come up with how they were associated to yeah. the deities and getting him to do that exercise. You can sure bet that later on he was referencing the names of some of the deities. And mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh yeah. now you remember because it's based on your character's objective. So yeah. That was kind of cool. I love to ask the players to create anything and then to bring it up in the game. It, is a great way to get them to think more deeply about their characters. It's a great way to offload some of the work that you do by creating the entire universe <laughs> for them. Let them do some of the work. And it's a great way to engage them later on when you reference the thing that they have made and they get to go, oh, cool, I know what that thing is. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's just a host of benefits. I, I know that some people, when I, when I do that, they get a little bit turned off by it. They, they want me to have all the answers as the game mm-hmm. master. And they're like, oh, this is weird that you're doing that. But, you know, they quickly buy into that philosophy once they've uh, fed into it, I find. Yeah. Like, a, a way I like to approach it is, you know, you give, you as the player give me the seeds of this thing, and then I'll water it, I'll watch them grow, and it will be slightly different when you encounter it, but it will come from your ideas and your initial things. So, mm-hmm. like, when they're making characters, give me some NPCs that you know, and some surface level information i'll go off and i'll develop that and the npc that you encounter won't be the same but it will come from you in the first instance absolutely absolutely uh anto before we wrap up did you have any last words of wisdom or parting thoughts as it pertained to pantheon creation and and using pantheons in games Yes. N- don't worry about how crazy your ideas might sound, because I guarantee the Greek pantheon was crazier. <laughs> Anything that you think of that you think, nah, there's no way, that's too out there, somewhere in the Greco-Roman pantheon, something more wild has happened. That's, that's good advice. Yeah, go, go off the wall for sure. And, and that's what makes them memorable, right? Is yeah. having a god of grape skin or whatever. Yeah. You know what? Go for it. Have at it. Because if there's enough people to if there's enough people to worship that, exactly, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I I can appreciate that. And then one last little bit of wisdom, uh, Anto, would be for folks to know where to find you and to find all of your content that they can read. Maybe you know get access to side quests just so that they can up their game on top of listening to your content. So can you remind us where we can purchase or or view your your other stuff? 
yeah, you can find links to all of my stuff at icarus-games.co.uk. That has links to my YouTube and SideQuest and just the plethora of things that I do. It's all on there. Awesome. Great. And that'll be in the show notes as well. So for folks uh, hoping to to link up with Anto, you can you can do that. I'll probably put your YouTube channel down mm-hmm. there too. And I'll put uh, maybe your uh, your drive through or if, if there's a Kickstarter going. I know you kickstart every side quest magazine, right? Uh, so I kickstart the annuals. So every, oh, okay, okay. every issue is on Patreon. And then once a year, we get 12 of the issues together and put them in a book because printing is expensive. Mm, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. So then there you go. So folks can can look forward to that and definitely, definitely worth checking out. And like I said at the beginning of the show, a lot of Anto's content was inspirational to me as a game master when I was learning how to do this stuff. And so I think, yeah, there's definitely, definitely a lot of value uh, for you to mine in Anto's backlog of material on YouTube. So go follow Icarus Games, uh, no doubt in my heart there for sure. So Anto, thank you for being on Roleplay Chat. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's been good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, with that, let's call it a chat. Awesome. As always, I'd like to thank the wonderful supporters of the show on Patreon. Right now, Domil's Wonderful Works is the only supporter of Roleplay Chat on Patreon, so big shout out to Domil. Thank you for your support. I'd also like to shout out the wonderful folks over at PocketBard. Thanks to Chase and Alex for allowing me to use their beautiful music as the intro and outro for Roleplay Chat. <laughs>